from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon. My name is Roberta Schaefer, and I have the absolute pleasure of serving as the Law Librarian of Congress here at the Library of Congress. And I'm delighted to welcome you to uh, the Law Library's annual commemoration of Human Rights Day. Uh, before I begin the program formally, I just want to give you a little bit of uh, background information about the space you're in, in the unlikely event of a water or other necessary evacuation today. So if uh, we should need to evacuate the room, law library staff will come to the aisles and they will direct you to a safe exit. So please do not be alarmed. And with that in mind, please make sure that all of your carry-ons are uh, secured under the seat in front of you. <laughs> that your tray tables are in their upright and locked position and that your minds are totally unlocked and open to a wonderful afternoon that I, I really can promise you. Oh, and one last thing. Please remember to uh, either turn your cell phone off or put it on vibrate. You do not want to be the person that has all of our eyes staring at you as you run out the back of the room. So welcome to our program. As the world celebrates International Human Rights Day today, the, uh, the Nobel Prize for Peace award ceremony is uh, taking place in Oslo, Norway. And the Peace Prize, uh, just to bring some facts together for you, is, you will remember, the only prize that's not presented in Stockholm. Rather, it's presented uh, in the presence of the King of Norway. And it is presented every day, uh, every year, excuse me, on December 10th, which is also Human Rights Day because that is the anniversary of Albert, Alfred Nobel's death. So it's kind of an interesting coming together of, uh, of calendar events, natural causes, and man-made causes. On Human Rights Day this year, the UN is spotlighting the role of largely unsung heroes. And for the UN, this really is referring to human rights defenders who, as individuals, risk misery, harassment, torture, indefinite jail, and even death for their activities. But I think we're going to take the theme and broaden it just a tad with our theme this year and say that unsung heroes, perhaps, are indigenous peoples everywhere, and therefore that is our focus of Human Rights Day this year. Indigenous people worldwide number about 300 to 50 million people. They embody and nurture 80% of the world's culture and biological diversity, and they occupy 20% of the world's land surface. Indigenous peoples of the world are very diverse. They live in nearly all the countries of the world, on all the continents, and form a spectrum of humanity, ranging from traditional hunter-gatherers and substance farmers to legal scholars. In some countries, they form the majority of populations. Others, they are but a small minority. They are concerned with preserving land, protecting language, and promoting culture. Some strive to preserve traditional ways of life, while others seek greater participation in current governmental structures. Like all cultures and civilizations, Indigenous peoples are always adjusting, adopting, and changing in a very changing world. Excuse me. Indigenous peoples and tribal peoples worldwide face complex threats to their survival as distinct peoples. The issue of indigenous cultural property rights is becoming more and more urgent. The UN has undertaken a study on the heritage of indigenous peoples and has put forth several recommendations. And the World Intellectual Property Organization, WIPO, has begun discussion on issues of indigenous peoples, intellectual and cultural property rights. Although many indigenous peoples are not entirely in agreement with the process or the forum for discussion. While it is evident 
that there can be no single solution to the issues owing to the diversity of cultures and realities across our planet. We need to recognize that the whole world has much to gain from recognizing and protecting the knowledge and cultures of indigenous and tribal peoples. We have a very distinguished panel for you this afternoon, and they will discuss intellectual and cultural property rights on a broad range of issues relating in the common factor to indigenous peoples. We hope to stimulate discussion, not only among ourselves this afternoon, but also among indigenous peoples and their representatives and across any forum that you can think of because we all have a stake in their future. We will reserve questions and answers until the end of the panel because we have these four very distinguished speakers who have lots of things to say and we want to be sure that we get their time managed properly. So please hold yourself back and hold your questions until the end. I also, in addition to wanting to give you the opportunity to look forward to a wonderful intellectual feast this afternoon, there will be a reception right in the foyer of this room following our formal presentation. You have uh, biographies of all of our speakers in the booklet, and they are such distinguished speakers and such distinguished people that I don't want to take the time to even summarize their background, so I will ask you to read what they have done and to postulate on um, where they will go with, uh, with such eminent credentials and experiences behind them. We will have the panelists present this afternoon in the order in which they appear in the program. So we will begin with Helen Stacy from Stanford University, followed by Stephen Clark and Kelly Buchanan, who are uh, from the Law Library of Congress. And then we will end, but certainly she is not last or least, with uh, Betsy Canale from the US Board on Geographic Names. So without further ado, let me turn the podium over to Dr. Helen Stacy. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Roberta, for, first of all, a wonderful invitation. Uh, I can't even gloat and tell you that California is sunny today. It's not. It's raining. <laughs> and thank you also to the other library staff, uh, including those who have helped set up the room for a warm welcome, and to my co-panelists. Uh, we've already been uh, raising issues, and I'm looking forward to a vibrant discussion that follows. In the time that I have with you today, I want to give you a tale of two different countries. My own home country, Australia, and South Africa, a country that I'm now uh, researching as part of a, a longer-term research project, a tale of two countries where the confrontation between the European colonial legalizing, governmentalizing structures of the old world going to the new world have had very particular effects upon those two lands, indigenous peoples. It's a complicated story, which, of course, has law at its center, not just because I'm a lawyer and because I see the world through legal lenses, but because in the process of the old world going to the new world to make the new world part of its, part of its empire, law has been an absolutely critical tool to turn new colonies into uh, lands that can be used, uh, have resources extracted from them, and peoples who can also be either used as labor, uh, and maybe even at some time, at some point in the distant future, be given the sort of political rights and responsibilities that were developing at home. So the two, the two stories I have for you of Australia and South Africa each have three parts. Uh, there's a triptych to each. And each of these stories demonstrate what a conundrum it is for Europe to really encounter the colonial other, especially when 
the old world comes to a new country, a new country which it sees as there for the taking, and yet at the same time is coming with a set of liberal, sometimes humanitarian values that seem appropriate back home in Europe, but all of a sudden are cast afresh in a new place where often the reason for being is one of appropriation and repression. Let me start a little bit by telling you about the Australian story in three parts. Australia, as I'm sure you all know, was part of the 19th century so-called discovery of the New World. It was a country that was colonised by the British, a place to send the ne'er-do-wells who were sitting in rotting ships in the middle of the Thames, those criminals who weren't worthy of hanging, uh, but nor were, um, could not be trusted to be released back onto the streets of London where they would repeat their acts of, of petty theft. England's solution was to send a couple of boats out to Australia where the very first military people worked off an assumption uh, under international law that an empty country could simply be taken by the first taker. Now, how, you might ask, could a country that was full of Australian Aborigines be seen by the English as being empty? Through an elegantly simple legal device known as terra nullius, which permitted the English colonists to construe the indigenous Aboriginal people as being non-people because they were nomadic. Now, remember, the British view of what it was to be a person in the world was, be, was to be a property owner, someone who is sitting on their land in their tenement house. Uh, they are using the land for arable purposes. They're farming it. They're keeping livestock within fences. They have a commercial system which is, to European eyes, visible. It's, it's based upon exchange of money, exchange of, exchange of goods, and most importantly, there are physical records of all of that commerce, physical records of all of that property ownership. The English came to Australia and saw semi-naked black people who uh, did not apparently stay in any one patch of territory, who seemed not to have crops, who seemed not to keep animals for domesticated purposes, and simply made the assumption that these people were not human, that, that the land was empty. The international law at the time said that if a land was occupied, then the colonizing force needed to make a treaty, needed to recognize the presence of those peoples by, by making a treaty with them, by crafting a document which said, we have arrived, um, you have permitted us to be here, we will have some sort of contract which recognises that there are two sides to the contract, there's you and there's us, and here are the terms of the contract. Not surprisingly, the contract of most colonial occupiers was not an even contract, it was an unfair bargain. But in Australia there was no need for a contract under law because there was no other side to the bargain, those people were invisible. It may astonish you to know, I now go to the second part of the three-part tale, that this assumption, this legal assumption that Australia was terra nullius, continued for almost 200 years in Australia. That didn't, of course, mean that laws weren't passed to regulate Indigenous people. Laws were passed, uh, not laws to give them citizenship and not laws to allow them to have passports, but laws which permitted the Australian state governments, Australia is a, is a federal uh, territory, just like the United States, there's a federal government and there are many state governments. Laws that permitted the state governments to pass uh, their own laws so that Aboriginal children could be taken away from their families and placed into missionary homes so that they could be civilised, they could be given the benefits of religion, they could be removed from the harm that living in nomadic camps with their families would give them, and given the benefits of all that is European. 
The reality of that was that these young people were, uh, were given out as indentured labourers and were given a stipend that was kept on their behalf by their white overseers. Finally, in 1990, a case went to the Australian High Court, led by an Australian Aboriginal who lived up on the Torres Strait Island, up in the north of Australia. This is now part three of the story. A Torres Strait Islander known as Eddie Marbo. He took to the High Court the claim that in the Torres Strait Islanders, that unlike other parts of Australia, that there had been a process of writing down the way that Torres Strait Islanders farmed their land. In fact, what had happened is that the missionaries in the 19th century had kept um, ledgers of how the indigenous Torres Strait Islanders had uh, raised crops in certain years, that there was agreement that from stick A to tree B that family X would farm those lands and that the waters off the coast of the Big Bluff would be for the farming or the fishing of, of a particular community group. In 1990, the Australian High Court held that the legal fiction of terra nullius was just that. It was a fiction. Now, the legal consequences of this were profound because it meant that the previous assumption that all of the land of Australia belonged to the Australian Crown, the Australian government, and could thus be given or sold to any of the settlers, it, it meant that that fiction no longer stood. And it left the court with a very peculiar conundrum. Here was 200 years of settlement of a country settled by wave after wave after wave of immigrants, first the English, uh, then the Chinese. The Chinese were often not permitted to, to hold property either. But then over the First World War and then increasingly the Second World War, wave after wave after wave of Italians, Poles, um, Hungarians, wave after wave of people who, who owned their house, who owned their farm, who were able to say that their house and their farm had been passed down to them from generation to generation to generation. A massive conundrum. A conundrum too, you can imagine, for the mining companies who had vast tracts of the Australian interior. Uh, most of Australia is 90% gathered around the, uh, the southeastern seaboard where there's enough rain to permit um, the sort of agriculture that is, is known far more familiarly to, to the European um, world. But a great conundrum for those who owned vast, vast parts of interior Australia in the hope that they might be able to mine it. The High Court there in this case was confronted thus with a legal problem, a huge legal problem. It solved the moral problem by saying that terra nullius had been wrong, it was a fiction, and it had done great harm. But the legal issue remained. What to do with the reality that here was an entire continent that had been subdivided and given away to people who were not its original inhabitants? Over the ensuing uh, nearly 20 years now, since the Mabo case, Australian Aboriginals have been able to make claims for uh, some of the return of their traditional land. Now this is where the notion of traditional ownership has become extremely complicated in Australia. The Mabo case decided very pragmatically that it would not be feasible to allow people who had acquired homes and farms, it would simply not be feasible to make all of that go back to the original inhabitants. They simply decided on a second legal fiction, which was those who had legal title today of land should keep it. It left in dispute a lot of crown land that didn't necessarily have one single owner, uh, but had 
been the ancestral lands of Aboriginal people and to which they sought access as part of their religion known as the dreaming. The Australian dreaming is the equivalent of, um, of, of Roman Catholicism. Instead of going into a church that has an altar, Australian dreaming has Aboriginal people literally crisscrossing Australia as they follow the tracks of their ancestors. It's an odyssey they take, they take, that takes place every few years. And uh, of course it doesn't, it, doesn't it doesn't imagine that it's going to encounter private property or fences. The solution to this is still being worked out legally. In some cases, Indigenous peoples are allowed access to cross land. There have been some land claims made for return of land. But the peculiarity here is that when Aboriginal people make their claim, either for access or for property return, they have to be able to demonstrate to a court that they are, in fact, Indigenous people who wish to exercise custom. Here's another fact you need to know about the displacement of Indigenous people off their lands. In Australia, this has meant that Aboriginal people have wound up in two different places. One is in the inner cities, where they usually live in one or two uh, neighbourhoods. Uh, they live very, very badly. They live as third world people in a first world country or they live in far, far flung uh, communities right in the outskirts of, of uh, rural areas. Not necessarily their tribal lands, but the lands that they have been permitted to settle on as a process over the years when they've been pushed off, off other lands. It won't surprise you to know that the rate of alcoholism uh, in the inner city uh, indigenous populations is very, very high. But here's the, here's the very sad coda to the three-part story of Australia's Indigenous people, uh, a three-part story that has them not recognised as human beings, first of all, uh, then having some legal rights given to them 200 years after the fact, and then now finding themselves piecemeal trying to reclaim small parts of their cultural and territorial heritage. The sad coda now to this is that in the last 10 years, those Aboriginal populations that are living in the rural communities have been torn apart by extraordinarily high rates of sexual violence against young, um, young children, very, very young children, often newborn children, with the consequence that now in a, a cruel and ironic twist of a return to the pre-Mabo days, there has been a decision made by the federal government to go back to the bad old days of not allowing indigenous peoples to collect their social security monies, but instead need to prove that they're worthy of collecting their social security money. The conditions today are that they have to demonstrate that their children are going to the health clinics, uh, that their children are not being abused, and they're sending their children to school. But as you can imagine, this is a deeply contentious and deeply ironic twist to a story that has been a story, a very bad story, created by the very process of colonisation. Let me take you now to South Africa, teleport you, uh, we're still in the Southern Hemisphere, but teleporting you uh, right across an ocean to another land that was also colonized, not just by the British, but by the Dutch and the Germans and the English, uh, a complicated tale of colonization. Uh, a different story from Australia because from the very outset the presence of the indigenous peoples was recognized with the consequence that there were a series of treaties made with the indigenous people. Now for what it's worth that means that at least the indigenous people were recognized as legal persons. I'm going to fast forward though from those early colonial times to the apartheid era which is probably known to many of you, an era in which the 10% white population passed laws which had the effect of uh, moving the 10% black 
population. It's not quite 90-10, it's 10% it's, uh, indigenous black South Africans, around 8%, up to 8% of what are known as coloureds, the whole mixture of Indian, uh, Middle Eastern peoples, and then the rest are, are white. But the apartheid regime laws had the effect of, yes, sending black people out of the cities back to what were called their homelands, but the land, the land that people were sent to did not necessarily or hardly ever correlate to the land where they had grown up, the land from which they drew their spiritual, their cultural, uh, their, uh, their ancestral genesis. Rather, it was a mechanism to permit labor to come into the cities like Johannesburg and Cape Town and then be moved out of the cities in a rotation so that there would be a constant supply of cheap labor, labor to the, to the uh, white minority. With the end of apartheid in the 1990s, and uh, as you can see, this, this story of Australia shares with uh, shares between it the, the vast sea change that took place in the 1990s, exactly the same time, remember, that the fall of the Berlin Wall has meant that a massively expanding a number of nation states in Eastern Europe are also crafting their own constitutions for the first time. With the fall of the apartheid regime in South Africa, there was the creation of a new South African constitution which sought to recognize the vast, vast indigenous diversity in South Africa. Uh, there are 11 languages recognized under the South African constitution. And also an attempt under the constitution to recognize the force of customary law. In fact, if you read the South African constitution, it's the longest constitution in the world. Uh, it's part of this whole constitutional moment that took place in the 1990s in the world as decolonization and the fall of the Soviet bloc meant that there was an attempt to craft constitutions in far more inclusive ways than either the United States Constitution or the Australian Constitution, which are really artifacts of an earlier time. The South African Constitution, in addition to uh, nominating human rights, the, or, the, the classic human rights that every every uh, American is aware of, the freedom of speech, freedom from detention, freedom from torture, uh, freedom of conscience. In the South African Constitution, there's a long, long list of human rights, none of which are organized or ranked hierarchically. They're all there on an even basis. One of them is the right to exercise customary law. And you can imagine with the terrific buoyancy of the post-apartheid moment, that inserting this into the Constitution was seen as a charismatic moment, a moment in which finally, finally, there was legal recognition given to a form of legal, political, and social ordering that might not be the same as the white majority's idea of law. It might not be constituted in bills and acts that go through a parliament or a congress. It might not come out of the sort of processes that we're so familiar with, but might be agreed amongst communities. It might be a process of evolution in communities over time, and the repositories of the law might be the elders of a community who have passed an oral history of law down generation by generation. It being in the Constitution then meant everything. It meant, it meant to symbolize the, not just the release of Mandela, of decades of imprisonment, and not just the end of a, a political era that had a caste a system based upon black and white, it was supposed to recognize that law takes many forms and we must not valorize just one process that Europeans are the most familiar with. There may be alternative and other means of legal ordering that are equally important, equally 
in need of recognition. But now here's the other twist to the tale. I told you that each story was a triptych. Here's the third part, the rather sad th third part of the South African story. You'll know that Nelson Mandela uh, uh, is now an old man. He's no longer president of, uh, of South Africa. Uh, there's, been, there's been another one in the interim, but the current, uh, the current leader of, of South Africa is a man called Jacob Zuma. He has four wives and I believe 27 children. And he is a man who came to power by portraying himself as being for the black people, as being an embodiment of custom and culture. And in fact, during the election campaign, his initial election campaign, his having four wives, his exercising polygamy was also used as, as, a, as, a, as a code, as a proxy for this valorization of custom. But here's the twist. As part of his political payback to political friends in the rural areas, the Zuma government has passed the Customary Lands Act, which has had and is having the most pernicious effects on black women in South Africa who have only in the last 15 years just started to be able to taste the beginnings of political, legal and sometimes e even social equality. Under the Customary Lands Act, there is a designation of chief status to elderly men in rural communities who have not necessarily acquired their chief status over, over generations, but who, who have acquired that status because they have become the political leader in their community. In other words, they are simply the guy who holds political power in the rural community. Under the Customary Lands Act, that man is able to uh, disqualify a woman from moving off the tribal lands if he wishes. He is able to stop her social security check for her children if he wishes. He is able to uh, force a woman to take back her husband when uh, she has been the victim of rape or domestic violence if he wishes. And here's the kicker, it's all in the name of custom. This then I think leaves us with a real moral dilemma. As lawyers and as human, right act, human, human rights activists, what we seek to do, I think, collectively, is to imbue each person with a sense of dignity and ask that our legal system recognize that dignity takes many forms, that part of human dignity is the capacity to be who you are, and that who you are may come in part from your identification from a cultural group. And yet we also know that politics and power is part of every single group. And that politics and power is often used for harm against those who have less power than those who exercise it. The conundrum that I think both the Australian and the South African case confront us with is that simply gesturing to custom as some sort of valorized special category that needs to be protected and acknowledged over and above other interests doesn't on its own solve the problem. That there's always going to be a contest between who gets to say which custom is the right custom. If you speak to any of those South African women who aren't able to move off their tribal land or who are forced to have their husband come back to rape her yet again, she will tell you that she had come to exercise a form of equality in the last 15 years that she doesn't want to surrender. 
and she's being asked to accept a version of custom that she will say, if one really reads the custom in my village, it's never been okay for men to rape their wives. And what we used to do was have a system where our family would come back and let us and take us back home. There might be issues of diary and, and bride worth, but there was an alternative mechanism that dealt with this question of violence within marriage. So you are forestalling me, first of all, from accessing my new rights under the Constitution, and you are secondly designating custom here in a way that is crass and political and all about paying back political cronies. And in some ways, <clears throat> the same thing is happening in Australia. Now, I don't want to leave you with just a sad story. I want to leave you with, uh, with I, want to, I want to make sure you understand that this notion of what it is to be an Indigenous person is a deeply, deeply loaded question. And that those who need to be at the table of answering it need to be many, not just those who have a vested interest in the system. And often, frequently, elders have the most invested in the system. And it's the voice of the younger folk who also need to be at the table when the matter comes up. Let me leave you with a story that uh, is, I think, a story of hope and also tells us, gives us some important lessons. Female genital cutting is a widespread phenomenon throughout Africa. And the way that some African countries have addressed this is by passing criminal laws to criminalize it and uh, which will make it a prosecutable offence for both the, uh, the midwife who conducts the procedure and sometimes also for the family who will allow their, will submit their little girl uh, to have the procedure carried out on her. Here's another irony. In Burkina Faso, where there is such a law to criminalise FGC, female genital cutting, or FGM, female genital mutilation, depending on how you want to use the term, the banning of it, or the criminalisation of it, has sent it underground to the point now where FGC is carried out on younger and younger, younger girls, and now newborns, so that if the newborn dies from blood loss, then her death can be easily explained as, as, a, as a newborn or, or childhood illness and not, uh, not make her parents or the midwife vulnerable to prosecution. So clearly law in this, in, in this instance is a very blunt tool and one that's had some perverse consequences. It's, it's reason to rethink the use of law. But here's what's happening in many, many communities throughout Africa where FGC is carried out. Self-run community groups of women, women from those communities themselves, are organizing alternate rituals of rites of passage, of from girlhood to womanhood, from boyhood to manhood, that involve a ceremony, that involve recognition, but may not involve infibulation of a girl's genitalia. It might involve a pinprick to her, her, to her finger, to her labia, but the point is it's not seeking to trash a culture, it's recognizing a culture, but it is seeking to see that culture is a living, organic, ever-changing phenomena, and that those who are best left in charge of its change are those who are practicing it, and that those who are at the cusp of practicing it, the young, are the interests that need to be especially paid attention to. So in finishing, I'd simply remind us that law is a wonderful tool. It can be a tool of great liberation. When it confronts indigenous people, it needs to be used with terrific care that the way in which it's used must, must, must be informed by those who are within the culture itself, and that it's those who are the most vulnerable in a culture who need to be at the table in framing what that culture is or maybe what it ought to be. So thank you, and I'll invite your questions later on.
Good afternoon. Um, I'm sorry they've changed my um, this, this is it. Thank you. I knew the technology would get me. Uh, in fact, I have to confess, uh, it got me even more than I realized. Uh, I thought it'd be nice to start out this presentation by uh, displaying a map of Canada um, so I could point to a few of the places I mentioned. Uh, I picked this one uh, because I thought it was so dramatic and it would show up uh, nicely on the um, on the screens. Uh, however, this morning as we were loading it, I noticed that uh, uh, the people who uh, put together this map uh, lost an entire province. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, I can assure you it's not a big one, but it, it, is, it, is, it has a long name, but it is um, you know, a very beautiful place and it's called Prince Edward Island and it's just north of Nova Scotia there. I know it's still there because I was just there five weeks ago. And I mean, you know, it couldn't have sunk or anything. So anyway, otherwise I think it's uh, fairly accurate. Um, um, I was going to start out by saying, um, uh, in the United States, it's been estimated that almost half of the arts and crafts, which are sold as Indian wares, are in fact essentially fakes. Uh, and the losses that Indian artisans have suffered over the years uh, from these uh, fraudulent um, uh, goods um, have, have exceeded billions and billions of dollars. Now, these fakes I'm talking about, I'm not talking about little rubber tomahawks that are sold in toy stores or, or packages of pumpkin seeds with Indian head logos on them. What I'm talking about are what might be considered valuable collector's items. And while a billion might not uh, be uh, as much as it once was, we can see that uh, this uh, problem of uh, un unauthentic uh, goods being sold is a definite problem in this country. Uh, Congress has seen this too and it, is it has enacted an amended legislation which I will uh, talk about shortly. I have not found similar estimates regarding the extent to which non-native art is being sold uh, through fraud or misrepresentation. Um, as being Aboriginal art in Canada when in fact it is not. But in talking to Native Affairs experts in Canada, people with the Department of uh, Indian and Northern Affairs, as well as Native artisans and from seeing a number of warnings uh, on the internet uh, about uh, fraudulent uh, goods being uh, sold over the internet, um, I think it's fair to say that it, clearly Canada has a, a similar problem, although perhaps not to quite as great an extent. Uh, one reason perhaps we don't have more information on the extent of the problem in uh, Canada is that unlike the United States Congress, Parliament has not enacted legislation for the specific purpose of guaranteeing the authenticity of Aboriginal art. Some reasons for this and what the Canadian government is doing instead, or perhaps not doing, um, to address this problem will be the subject of my short talk today. Before getting to that, however, I thought I might uh, briefly identify the Aboriginal people of Canada. There are three groups of Aboriginals. Um, the first, appropriately enough, is the uh, First Nations, or what used to be called Indian tribes uh, more often than they are today. There are about 50 recognized bands in Canada and uh, the majority of their members live on what are called reserves as opposed to reservations in the United States. Actually, some of the reserves and re reservations even straddle uh, the country, two countries straddle the border. The largest uh, single tribe in Canada is the Cree, and the second largest is the Ojibwe or Chippewa. Parenthetically, in this country, the largest uh, Indian tribe by far is the Cherokee, and uh, the second largest would be the Navajo. 
In the East, the two major families uh, of Indian uh, bands uh, were traditionally the Algonquin and the Iroquois. Many of uh, the bands that you, know, you might know the names of, Mohawks, Seneca, others, um, would fit into one of those two families. Um, the Algonquin and um, Iroquois were often at war with one another, but not exclusively. Even within the families, there were wars. For example, I just learned uh, that the Huron, which uh, were often uh, allied with the French uh, during the French and Indian Wars, and all, uh, were actually an Iroquois family, although they were never part of the uh, Iroquois Confederacy. Um, and so they were often at uh, war with uh, some of the other members of the Confederacy. In any event, the majority of the remaining Eastern bands are located in Ontario. Though Quebec, uh, and these are Ontario, you probably all know, right in the middle here, has about a quarter of the Nat uh, First Nations population. And <coughs> Quebec um, has uh, a fairly significant percentage too. Um, smaller groups, probably <coughs> the next largest, probably be in Nova Scotia in the east. Uh, out west, uh, you of course have the Plains Indians, uh, famous uh, tribes such as the Sioux, Blackfoot, and Crow. Um, and uh, further west, out in British Columbia, um, they have a number of their own indigenous uh, tribes, which uh, some of you may have seen at the uh, colorful opening ceremonies of the Vancouver Olympics, uh, which I guess was just earlier this year. It seems like longer ago than that. But uh, in any event, when people, foreigners, think about Aboriginals in Canada, they probably usually first think of the Inuit, or the people who used to be referred to as the Eskimos. Uh, Actually, they, uh, the Inuit are the smallest of the three Aboriginal groups of Canada. And um, it appears that the First Nations have a combined population of approximately 700,000. Uh, the Inuit, by contrast, are only about 50,000 in Canada. And most of them live up in Nunavut. This is a territory which was actually carved out of the Northwest Territories to the west in 1999, more or less to create a, a homeland for the Inuit people. And um, there are also uh, Inuit in Quebec and this part of Newfoundland, uh, the province of Newfoundland, Labrador, which is actually northern Labrador there. Um, the Inuit are closely related to the Inuit of Alaska and Greenland. Uh, I was recently at a conference up in Canada, and it was interesting because there was a, um, the premier of uh, Nunavut was there, as well as uh, the foreign minister of Greenland. And it was kind of interesting sitting just before the, uh, they were to make their presentations to listen to them speaking their native language uh, and seem to be understanding each other um, quite easily, uh, although uh, I can't say the same of myself. Um, uh, anyway, uh, there is a third group of Aboriginal people in Canada, and that's the Métis. Uh, they do have constitutional recognition, um, and the Métis essentially um, are uh, descendants of, um, of, uh, of um, mixed marriages between um, uh, European, often uh, traders, and uh, uh, First Nations people. Uh, over the years, they have evolved their own culture um, and their own standing. The Supreme Court has established a test for who uh, can uh, qualify as a Métis, um, and um, it's a three-part test. Uh, um, but a, a substantial portion of the Métis um, are so qualified through self-identification. Um, so taken all together, the Aboriginal population of Canada is probably slightly over one million. And that would contrast to um, the figure in the United States, which is probably, we probably have around almost two million, almost twice as many. But of course, the population in the United States is about 10 times as large as that of Canada. So let's go on to the subject of art. And um, 
and I'll try and hit my enter button here. What are the types of arts from Canada which are considered most collectible? And I think the first uh, thing p people probably think of are the Inuit soapstone <coughs> carvings. Um, these come from the far north, the Arctic. Um, they usually depict uh, animals or uh, hunters, as uh, in these two pictures here. Um, they're usually sold in um, special Inuit stores or uh, often in hotels. Uh, the high-end hotels in Canada will have special Inuit galleries. Um, they're very prized, generally fairly expensive. I have two little ones over here. You're welcome to come up and look at them uh, um, and um, uh, see what they feel like. They're actually quite heavy. Inuit drawings are also uh, very popular, and I picked uh, these two as being quite representative uh, of the type of scenes that um, you will uh, find in Inuit galleries. Um, I picked this as an example of a uh, native painting. This would be a First Nations uh, work. It's quite representative. This type of scene is, is very common uh, in First Nations art. Uh, it's a little bit more realistic, perhaps, than um, um, the Inuit art, but it uh, generally depicts uh, uh, nature scenes or, or animals. Uh, West Coast art is also highly collectible and uh, off, uh, is uh, perhaps the most famous type of West Coast art is, uh, are the carvings, uh, which can extend from totem poles down to small plaques. and. Uh, also, West Coast art, the same type of art is also featured in paintings. Um, I don't know if this quality is quite as an art is perhaps a mixture of art and crafts. Uh, also, from the West, uh, we have uh, um, a certain type of knitting made of a certain type of cloth, uh, Kawashan uh, uh, knitting, and um, that is also considered highly collectible. Um, Aside from those, you will find dotted throughout the reserves of Canada a number of very small little places where items are uh, sold that are produced on the reserve. Uh, we're going now from the high-end galleries of the fancy hot hotels, the Chateau Laurier's and others, uh, to um, um, very modest uh, buildings on, on reserves. I took this picture just about uh, five weeks ago, six weeks ago, in Nova Scotia, uh, Cape Breton, Nova Scotia, in fact. And the gentleman who owned this uh, particular store had baskets, had quite a few pelts and uh, antlers, these types of little, you can see the little teepees, things like that, that were made uh, by local craftsmen. This is a picture of some um, feather work. And here's a picture, uh, you can see I'm in there, and there's a coyote between us with a, a giant uh, basket, which the community had uh, gotten together to make as a display for his shop. Uh, uh, that, that is indeed, I think they felt that was probably the biggest basket that had ever been uh, <laughs> made. And, uh, uh, and he would be from the Micmac uh, um, um, uh, band of uh, Nova Scotia. So those are the types of arts that are, are generally uh, considered quite collectible um, and uh, gives you some feeling of you know, where they're sold. Um, I'm going to switch uh, uh, very quickly here to talk about what we've done about the problem, the general problem of authentication in the United States. Since 1935, we've had an Indian Arts and Crafts Act, but the current one actually dates from 1990. It's been updated, uh, it's been amended in 2000, it was uh, more recently uh, amended, amended in 2010. And I'll uh, just quote quickly from the uh, U.S. Department of Interior, Indian Arts and Craft Board, uh, it's description of the law, which is that uh, it's basically a truth in advertising law that prohibits misrepresentation of marketing of Indian arts and crafts um, as being produced in the United States. It is illegal to offer a display for sale or sell any art or craft product in any matter 
that falsely suggests it is Indian produced, an Indian product, or the product of a particular Indian or Indian tribe or Indian arts and crafts organization uh, resident within the United States. It's a fairly broad definition, um, a little difficult to uh, um, summarize, but uh, it, I would say that's a, a broad definition. Um, and for a first time violation, an individual can uh, face a fine of up to $250,000 and a five year uh, um, a sentence of imprisonment. Businesses uh, can be fined up to a million dollars for violating the Indian Arts and Crafts Act. So Congress has taken a pretty aggressive uh, step forward in trying to um, uh, uh, guarantee the authenticity of Indian arts and crafts. Um, the major problem is that within Native groups, there's been great cynicism that this act, although it dates back to 1935, has never been enforced very vigorously. And in fact, one of the major problems was that uh, law enforcement under the act was assigned to the FBI. The FBI simply did not have resources to uh, prosecute violations uh, uh, or investigate violations. Uh, and that is why the law was amended largely through the efforts of Senator McCain and a few other senators uh, from, from the Southwest, particularly concerned with this problem, uh, to uh, provide for uh, uh, that other law enforcement officials can uh, investigate uh, violations and bring uh, uh, charges under the Indian uh, Arts and Crafts Act. Now, Canada has not followed that uh, model. And I've talked to people in the Department of Indian Northern Affairs. Uh, they're very aware of what's been done in the United States. And uh, uh, they um, say they are definitely following uh, developments here, uh, monitoring how, how well uh, our laws work. But for the time being, their approach has been to, rather than to design a law specifically uh, like the Indian Arts and Crafts Act has been to work with I individual Indian uh, tribes or for, uh, Aboriginal groups to make them better aware of what can be done under current law to promote uh, uh, their wares and uh, to um, discourage the selling of uh, fakes. And probably the major um, uh, legal tool that is available right now is the use of certification marks. This is under trademark law, and it's where an organization can take out a trademark and then license it to other groups. The group that takes out the trademark cannot be involved in the actual production of the uh, goods that uh, it will be assigned to. But, uh, I know I hit the wrong button at some point here. Um, but I think I'm okay. Um, I think it works. Yeah. yeah. yeah we'll go back. Yeah, I'm going to have to go scrolling through them. I'm sorry. I'm probably know I'm also running uh, short on time here. Um, so that uh, the, the group that takes out a certification mark, by the way, we also have certification marks here in the United States and they're used often for geographical purposes and, and some others. Um, the Canadian uh, certification, uh, legal language uh, for certification marks makes it more clear um, that it can be um, uh, applied for and granted to uh, an organization for the purpose of, of um, certifying who had the input into the making of the, um, of the goods upon which it will be placed. So it, it seems it's a little more clearly tailored uh, for, uh, to the advantage of Indian tribes or First Nations tribes and other Aboriginal groups um, that would like to apply it to their wares. Um, certification marks um, um, do uh, provide a, a certain uh, uh, guarantee of authenticity. Um, actually, ironically, um, the most famous certification mark is not technically a certification mark. It is simply a trademark, but it is, it is used as a certification mark. 
and it is called the igloo tag, and it, that is uh, fixed to almost all Inuit uh, um, uh, carvings that are, are sold in Canada and other type. You may notice it still uses the term Eskimo art, even though. Um, I, I photoed this, so actually, um, my colleagues kindly photoed this for me, um, and uh, so that it would, I could display. And you can see this, on, I think it came on my little Inukshuk there. Um, it gives the name of the, uh, um, of the uh, artist, the uh, place where it was made, the year, what it is. Oh no, it's, it's my seals uh, igloo, um, which is the other one, and uh, and, and a uh, identification number. Um, that's the man. Yeah, the other truck. <laughs> and that's the. This is the. These were used to sort of mark territory out on the ice uh, for many different reasons, um, all of which we're not entirely sure. Um, but um, they are definitely um, very distinctive and, uh, and commonly seen. This is a little uh, seal, and uh, it's so uh, he actually stands up, uh, um, <coughs> but he can fall over, <laughs> as I found out when he, he lost his arm, so. <laughs> anyway. The igloo tag has is, is, um, is, is been a model, and the uh, Canadian government's approach has been to try to get other Aboriginal groups to adopt use of something similar to igloo tag. Um, the Kawashan uh, have uh, um, begun using certification marks on their, on their uh, knitted uh, goods. Um, other groups, I've, I've actually done a little bit of, uh, you know, uh, in person research, walking around from shop to shop, and I have not seen um, uh, um, usage of um, certification marks for other uh, native goods. Um, and I think that is one thing that the uh, government is can of Canada is trying to do, is to try to encourage greater use, because it does uh, give the uh, consumer a, um, uh, some guarantee that the goods are authentic which is only fair. I mean, uh, the loss of revenue to peoples who can perhaps least afford it, it has been fairly unconscionable over the years. Uh, and I know it's something that uh, you know um, officials in both Canada and the United States would like to address. So thank you very much. In preparing to talk to you today about um, this topic of Māori culture and its recognition and, and uh, protection in um, New Zealand intellectual property law, I was lucky enough to come across a great deal of material um, on the topic. It's, it's been something that's um, been very, a very active topic of discussion in New Zealand over the last 20 or so years. Um, and Māori have, uh, the Māori people have themselves have been very active in, in raising and, and discussing the issues um, both domestically and internationally. It's a very big topic, so I hope to just uh, give you a, a good overview of the issues and, and some of the approaches um, to them in New Zealand. So I thought I'd give you a uh, bit of a background first, some history about the Māori people, uh, including the um, Treaty of Waitangi, uh, and also um, secondly talk to you about some of the challenges, uh, general challenges of using intellectual property law to protect uh, traditional cultural expressions from inappropriate or unauth unauthorised use. And thirdly, um, I'll discuss two examples um, that I hope will be uh, interesting to everyone that and they're probably the most identifiable expressions of Māori culture. Um, that's largely because uh, they've become infused or incorporated into the broader New Zealand culture and, 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 and to, to an extent our identity as well, um, and they've become very popular overseas and that's the haka and the koru. Um, there have um, been some unique changes to uh, New Zealand's intellectual property law um, in, in the last 10 years or so, and I'll also talk to you about a, a major inquiry into cultural property rights 
and the Treaty of Waitangi that may have an impact on the law in the future. So this will just be a very quick background. Obviously, the, the topic of uh, Māori culture and history is, is huge and um, very interesting. Um, but just, just a quick glimpse into it. Uh, Māori make up uh, about 15% of, of the population now. Uh, they've been in New Zealand for about 700 years. Um, and Europeans have started arriving sort of from the late 1700s, early 1800s. Um, the experiences of the, of the Māori people, um, listening to, to Helen speak about um, uh, Australia and South Africa, there, ha there have been um, some similarities in terms of uh, the experiences of colonisation compared to other indigenous peoples um, in terms of um, in the decline of the culture, um, numerical decline, uh, land loss, um, uh, and some discrimination in uh, state policies. Um, but there have been some, some differences as well. Um, since the um, 1960s, Māori have become more vocal and organised in their calls for the promises made in the Treaty of Waitangi to be honoured and for more equal treatment in general. And in the past couple of decades, there's been a, an increased commitment to the concept of biculturalism. And th this includes the notion that uh, Māori culture should exist and be respected on an equal footing with the broader New Zealand, I guess the New Zealand European uh, culture. And, I think there's certainly aspects now that um, you can see uh, Māori culture becoming as much more visible, um, more integrated, certainly into um, New Zealand politics uh, and, and law, and to some extent society as well. Uh, for example, uh, you'll see government departments having um, an English name and a Māori name. Um, the, uh, Māori is frequently spoken um, in the parliament um, and as part of the parliamentary rituals as well. Um, and, and in addition to um, the increasing recognition of Māori interests in the law and government policies, a key focus has become uh, the settlement of grievances arising from bre breaches of the treaty. This involves um, formal inquiries by the Waitangi Tribunal, which was established in 1975, um, as well as direct negotiations between the government and different Māori tribes to reach final, uh, final agreements regarding redress. It is important that I uh, tell you about a bit about the Treaty of Waitangi. Um, unlike the Australian experience, um, this the treaty uh, well, is, a, is a key document in New Zealand's um, history. Um, as Helen said, it, it, it did, does relate to the fact that uh, Māori society was was quite different in appearance when when the, the English arrived. So they had est established settlements. They had um, systems for, of trade and um, and um, justice systems, that sort of thing, between between and within tribes. So they were very identifiable as a, an existing um, settler and, and culture. Um, and and the, the, the treaty itself now is, is, is remains very relevant in terms of the claims that Māori make uh, regarding uh, protection of their traditional knowledge and cultural expressions. It was signed in 1840 by uh, rep representatives of the British Crown and more than uh, 500 Māori chiefs. It is considered um, in New Zealand's constitutional arrangements to be uh, the country's founding document. Essentially it, it provided the right for the British to govern and uh, in return it guaranteed protection of certain rights for Māori and that included um, citizenship rights, guaranteed the rights as, as British, British citizens um, and also property rights. There were two versions of the treaty signed, uh, one in Māori and the other in English. Uh, the fact that when, when they're translated, they don't exactly match up in terms of their, the meanings of the words, <laughs> <laughs> that, that has been a source of, of much debate um, <laughs> over the years in terms of what exactly was promised and, and what exactly it means. There were just three articles uh, in the treaty, um, and Article 2 that you see um, is particularly important in the context of considering cultural property rights. Um, the English version uh, guarantees possession of lands and, and other properties and includes um, collective ownership, while the Māori version refers to tino ranga tiratanga, which essentially means uh, chieftainship, full authority, um, and it also refers to taonga, which uh, is anything highly prized or treasured. And to Māori, this would include 
tangible and intangible things, such as their language, traditional knowledge, and uh, cultural expressions. Due to the, the different translations um, and the different meanings that, that can be derived from it, it is common in legislation and in, in government policy to refer to the principles of the treaty. These essentially uh, apply to the relationship between government and the Māori people. They, they've arisen from court decisions, from government statements, and from uh, Waitangi Tribunal reports. These principles, uh, partnership, the duty of active protection, the right to self-regulation, the right to redress, and the duty to consult Māori on issues that affect them, they, they are re relevant to Māori claims relating to the protection, use, and control of their traditional cultural expressions, and how those, uh, the development of those protections themselves. Now, the, the challenges of somehow incorporating protection of indigenous cultural expressions into a conventional intellectual property regime such that exists in New Zealand has been recognised by different countries and at the international level. Um, as Rebecca was saying, there's been work at um, the UN and, and, at, and at WIPO on these issues. And, and the issues that New Zealand faces are, are very similar to those that have been discussed at the international level. They essentially arise from a difference in world views and approaches to property in general. In the context of intellectual property law, we're used to thinking about individual ownership on the part of an identifiable author of a, an original work. Um, the, we think of the economic benefits and the ability to stop others from using or copying our work. And we understand that there's time limits um, on how long that protection lasts. After a, a long or short period of time, work can become part of the public domain, domain and people are able to use it and, and interpret it later on. But for Māori and Indigenous peoples, uh, other Indigenous peoples, there, there are quite different cultural norms that mean that they see property and the ownership of ideas quite differently. There, there's a great deal of historical and cultural knowledge behind the ideas and expressions that they would see as needing to be protected rather than just the expressions themselves per se people see themselves as the guardians of that knowledge rather than necessarily the owners of it in a strictly legal sense. So, And cultural expressions are uh, symbolic of broader, more holistic meanings and are important to the identity of the group. The value of the expressions therefore doesn't necessarily involve money, but more collective and non-tangible benefits. Certainly there are economic benefits uh, to be gained as well, and that's the sort of issue that uh, Steve was talking about and something that's being looked at at the international level in the context of intellectual property law and the, and the development, development opportunities for Indigenous peoples. So I thought it would be most interesting to discuss a couple of examples of Māori cultural expressions in order to demonstrate the issues in New Zealand. The first is the haka, which is a war dance or um, challenge, and actually there are many different haka, but the most well-known one is the Kamasi Haka that is performed by the national rugby team, the All Blacks. So as you don't live in a rugby crazy country like New Zealand is, <laughs> uh, I'm not sure how many of you have actually seen it, a uh, full performance of the Haka, so I thought I'd give you a bit of a taste if this is going to work and the sound goes. And <laughs> the Haka is always treated with the greatest of respect in France. in France where that was. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that, that was from a game against France and I think it was back in 2004 that... Did they win? Oh, <laughs> I wouldn't like to speculate on that. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> no, <laughs> we won't get into Australian and um, New Zealand <laughs> rugby debate at all. But um, and, and 
it has been performed by the All Blacks since uh, 1905, but certainly not as um, fiercely or as competently as it has been as it is, it is, as it is now. It um, was a little bit <coughs> embarrassing, I actually found a, um, a video that does go through the history of the All Blacks performing the haka, and um, it, it was done with a little bit more jest, it seemed, a, a little bit more satire, I think, um, earlier. But um, certainly now, uh, knowledge and meaning of the haka and its significance and how to perform it um, is a very big part of the team culture and, and the vast majority of New Zealanders watch it with great pride and um, you sort of get the tingles on your neck and that sort of thing. So it's a, it is a very, it's a very um, strong part of, of our, um, I guess, our New Zealand um, cultural identity. And as you can see from the uh, pictures here, it's not just performed by the All Blacks. It's, um, it is part of our culture, it's performed by um, different sports teams, um, by New Zealanders at sporting events to show pride and to celebrate excess, success, and it's also performed by um, travellers, um, there are many of us, uh, who um, want to de demonstrate their New Zealand identity. I think, uh, I'm not sure what year it was, but a, a few years ago, um, a, a large number of people in the hundreds um, turned up in Trafalgar Square in London on, on Waitangi Day, which is um, the day that the, the treaty was signed, um, to f perform a uh, mass haka. Um, and in, in, this, in these pictures we've got uh, on the bottom uh, left of the screen is a, um, a picture of the New Zealand Olympic team performing the, performing the haka in Beijing in 2008. Uh, like the All Blacks, they, um, the team was taught about the meaning, uh, about the significance of the hackers, part of their preparations for the event. Above that, there's a picture of a group of men. Uh, they, they're, it looks like they're in a meeting house. Um, they may have been performing it in a meeting or and practicing it for, for some event that they were going to. Um, then we have two other examples um, from New Zealand. The picture of the gingerbread men performing the haka uh, is from a TV ad um, for the New Zealand Baker of the Year Challenge. And in the top corner there is a haka Santa, which I thought was appropriate given the <laughs> season. He's dressed in rugby boots and, and everything. He's got a haka hat on. And, um, but the, the haka's become popular overseas as well, um, I, with the All Blacks performing it all, all around the world and, and rugby being a big sport in places like Europe and um, in South, South America as well. Um, Two, two of the examples of its use in a commercial context are um, an Italian ad for Fiat cars, which is the picture of the woman uh, performing it on the right-hand corner, uh, and, and an ad for a Scottish whisky, which is obviously the one with the men lifting their, their kilts in response to the challenge from the haka. Now, some Māori have uh, raised very strong concerns about ads like these, uh, including the gingerbread one from New Zealand. Uh, they're often satirical, they don't in involve an appreciation or understanding of the Māori culture, and there are various aspects of them that breach the protocols that relate to the haka. Uh, Māori were not consulted uh, and therefore weren't able to explain the meaning of the haka, its significance, uh, or the protocols, and, and took, took great offence at, at both the, the showing of it and the lack of consultation. So complaints were made to the com directly to the companies concerned in relation to both of those foreign ads, um, but with little success in terms of them removing um, the content at all, but um, I, they, they did um, get some media attention and, uh, to the issues. There were, there were various articles overseas about it. The Ngati Tor tribe, which was the tribe of the author of the Kamisa Haka, um, who's a warrior chief called Te Raupraha, um, who wrote the Haka back in 1821, they have given permission to the All Blacks to use the haka, and they ha they've said um, explicitly that they're fine with the New Zealand public performing it as well. Where their concerns lie is with its inappropriate use in a commercial setting without prior consultation. Now last year, uh, I think it was February last year, as part of the process of settling treaty claims by Ngāti Tōa, the government did recognise the significance of the haka to the tribe, and they promised to work with it to figure out a way to prevent the misappropriation and culturally inappropriate use or performance of the haka. As part of this, the government has said, we'll consider the interests of the broader public, who, uh, as I said, with it forming part of the identity, there is a, a strong interest in the issue. Uh, they also um, will consider the need for any protection to be complementary to the conventional inte intellectual property system, uh, and, and also the need for the, any approach to be consistent with the government's response to the inquiry that I mentioned and that I will talk about shortly. The government has also said that the final settlement will not confer full ownership rights and the tribe won't be able to claim royalties uh, or veto the use of the haka. So it will remain a, a 
traditional ownership issue, but um, th what, it, what it appears that will result is some form of statutory consultation requirements. The form and wording of the legislative provisions that give effect to this will be very interesting to see, um, and they'll be, I'm sure, the su subject of great public attention in New Zealand. It's also unclear how they might apply in the international context um, uh, in terms of how they'd, they'd be enforced if an international company was to use the haka without consultation and things like that. But certainly I think um, it will give clarity in terms of who, where the interests lie, uh, which tribes should be consulted, what, you know, if there's some sort of system set up um, or framework set up for, for consultation, um, even if there's not um, conventional um, intellectual property rights to ownership. Now the next example is also something that's been infused into the broader New Zealand culture. The koru pattern is based on the unfurling frond of the silver fern. It symbolises new life, growth or renewal, and it was traditionally used by uh, Māori and, and jewellery, um, things like bone and wood carvings, um, tattoo, and on the decorative panels inside meeting houses. It's very common to see the design in a, in a range of souvenir products. Um, it's also common to see it um, in, in tattoos that are worn by non Māori, including people overseas. Um, and it's used in uh, trademarks and in the branding of products and services, including New Zealand's national airline. I've actually found a, a couple of examples of its use here in the States as well, which I sort of did a bit of a search and, and saw that there's uh, two day spas uh, here that use the word koru in their name, mm -hmm. and they use this, the symbol as part of their branding. And in, in most, I would say in most instances, including those two New Zealand, uh, so two US examples that I found, the connection with the Māori meaning of the koru is maintained. Uh, the symbol is often somehow linked to New Zealand's clean green image, uh, its unique cultural heritage, and as well as with the day spas, obviously things like um, notions of peace and tranquility. But they do specifically mention the, the Māori meaning of, of the koru and why it's been used. Um, and I should mention that the necklace that I'm wearing is a, a koru design made from greenstone. Um, it's not uncommon for to see New Zealanders wearing um, items such as this when they're overseas. Again, it's an example of uh, Māori cultural expressions being used as an expression of New Zealand identity. And this one actually, um, following on from uh, Steve's presentation, it, it, carries, it carries the Māori-made mark, which is toy iho. Uh, that's the authentication uh, mark used by Māori artists. Um, this mark was launched uh, by the government in 2002, um, but government funding was actually, um, for it was actually cancelled last year. Um, I, th I do understand that a foundation of um, Māori artists has, has purchased store is looking to purchase the trademark in order for it to continue to be used. Um, the removal of funding followed from a review which found that um, it hadn't create, generated additional benefits uh, uh, separate from the existing Māori art industry, which is um, fairly strong in terms of um, identifiable uh, vendors of, of Māori art and things like that. And Māori artists that use the koru and other traditional designs uh, can of course access um, copyright protections um, for their contemporary work, and this is important in terms of economic development opportunities, as is the, the um, toy or uh, trademark. But there, in general, there, there are a few avenues for Māori to exercise the guardianship or the control of how the culture and the knowledge is uh, transmitted, is promoted, um, or how it's used commercially. There have been attempts in New Zealand to address this in the intellectual, some of the issues in the intellectual property law. Um, so one way that Māori can have an impact on the use of their culture for commercial purposes is through provisions in the trademarks uh, legislation that were introduced in 2002. Uh, one, one of the stated purposes in the new legislation uh, was actually to address Māori concerns about the registration of trademarks that contain a Māori sign, imagery or text, um, and in order to achieve this purpose the legislation required the establishment of a Māori advisory committee um, to provide advice to the Trademarks Commissioner on whether particular uh, trademark applications should be refused because they would be offensive to Māori. Uh, it's an absolute ground for refusing to register a trademark, although um, I couldn't find an example of where that it had been refused, it appears that it would, it's more used in a, um, a, as an advice function um, and, and people are invited to resubmit um, the applications where, they, where the Māori Advisory Committee has identified issues with their uh, proposed mark. Um, they have actually provided some guidance on the use of the uh, koru and trademarks as well, but I think 
given the um, the extent to which it's used and, and the, the fact that it's um, it can f make take so many different forms um, and the fact that the ties with Māori culture are, are acknowledged and respected and, and in most cases in its use, um, I think had an impact on the guidance which basically states that the use of the kōru will be acceptable for brands relating to a wide range of goods and services. The uh, changes to the trademarks legislation were actually part of a, a broader review of New Zealand's intellectual property laws that commenced in the early 1990s. Um, included um, various discussion documents um, that we have some of them here in the li library um, as well and, and also meetings with Māori representatives. Um, a Māori trademarks um, commi um, committee was established to um, discuss the issues and concerns um, and to try and get something in the legislation that would address those. And then this process has also resulted in the proposed changes to the patents legislation uh, this, this bill, the Patents Bill, is currently awaiting its final stages in Parliament. Uh, the provisions in the bill will allow for the consideration of Māori values in the context of the patent registration process. Um, it relates specifically to Māori traditional knowledge in, in relation to their uh, into indigenous flora and fauna. Um, and, an and again, an advisory committee would be established to um, provide advice on, on the issues and whether the commercial expo exploitation uh, would be contrary to, to Māori values. It appears that the legislation may have been delayed this year. Um, it, it actually got reported back from uh, the Select Committee uh, in, uh, I think it was March this year. But it appears it may have been delayed due to the impending release of a major report by the Waitangi Tribunal on claims um, that are related to the use um, and protection of traditional knowledge um, relating to an indigenous flora and fauna and as well as um, covering broader cultural property rights. So this, this inquiry is, um, is known as Y262. Um, it's the first time that the, the tribunal has considered intellectual property laws in the context of possible contemporary breaches of the treaty. Uh, the claimants contend that uh, New Zealand's intellectual property legislation is inconsistent with the guarantees in Article 2 of the treaty. Uh, they also argue that the Crown has a duty to protect Māori rights relating to, tradi to tradi traditional knowledge and expressions um, and that they should provide for kaitiakitanga uh, or guardianship in, in the laws and, and policies relating to these rights. Uh, the notion of kaitiakitanga is actually present in, in other laws in, including the resource management le legislation uh, where um, guardianship of um, different areas such as um, the foreshore and things like that are, um, are recognised in the legislation. Um, the tribunal has previously indicated that the final report on the inquiry um, would be released this year. Um, it's been a, a long and complex process. There's been many um, hearings. There's been um, various uh, pieces of evidence presented by the claimants and, and by the Crown as well, and um, as well as reports commissioned by the tribunal into, um, what, into the details of the issues. The, the claims were, were lodged by um, Māori groups um, originally in the 1990s, but hearings didn't start until uh, 1997. The, uh, the final report of the tribunal is likely to generate considerable, considerable discussion. Uh, the government um, isn't bound by the um, recommend recommendations of the tribunal, but um, they, they are considered carefully um, and, and they will likely um, form a, a formal response um, to them in some way. Um, along, with, uh, so along with the specific provisions relating to the haka that I uh, mentioned earlier, uh, this inquiry could uh, result in broader legislative changes. Um, it, could, it could go as far as a separate framework um, in some way that sits alongside the, the existing um, intellectual property framework um, that relates to Māori interest in protecting aspects of their culture from um, inappropriate and unauthorised use. Um, at least in New Zealand, and um, it'll be interesting to see what impact that may have um, in terms of use internationally or, or any contribution to the international discussion on, on um, the rights of Indigenous peoples. So I hope I've um, provided some insights into the experiences in, in New Zealand um, and, and of Māori in terms of the issues um, relating to protection of cultural expressions. It's a very live topic um, of discussion, um, and it will involve a lot more debate. Um, I actually see that this week there's a uh, conference being held in New Zealand um, relating to intellectual property and the knowledge assets of Indigenous peoples. It's looking at 
uh, how Indigenous people can harness uh, economic e opportunities arising from their traditional knowledge. Um, and there's a much broader discussion in the Pacific as well, and the Pacific plan um, includes reference to, to the type of economic advantages and, and uh, um, the type of frameworks that might be, might be needed to protect traditional knowledge. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, thank you very much for the invitation to participate in this panel on human rights. Um, I, I've never done anything like this before. Um, I guess I've seen my work kind of in a more technical context, although I felt that it's very important. And I chose to go in the direction I did with this particular committee that I'm involved with uh, to actually uh, specifically have an opportunity to speak to the human rights uh, aspect of it is, is a new experience for me. So I'll try not to bog you down too much in technical and bureaucratic details, but I am a, a good federal employee, so I, I, I'm liable to put you to sleep here in a few spots. So bear with me. Uh, I'm here today to talk to you about the U.S. Board on Geographic Names and in particular about um, our efforts to revise our policy on Native American names and tribal coordination. Uh, but to start out, I have to put in a plug for my own agency. I come from the U.S. Forest Service. We're a land management agency under the Department of Agriculture, so maybe you would wonder why in the world does that have anything to do with geographic names? So I'm gonna try to make some connections. Uh, we are a uh, multi-use mission agency. In other words, we're not like the United States Park Service in that they focus on preservation of cultural and natural resources. We do that, but we also have to manage the land for other kinds of activities, such as uh, um, timber management, um, mineral extraction, grazing. Um, while at the same time, if you look up in the uh, right-hand corner there, that adorable little owlet, maybe you are familiar with the story of the northern spotted owl and some of the problems that direct conflict with um, timber in the North Pacific Northwest. Um, another endangered species, the uh, red cockaded woodpecker, needs protection. Recreation is a really uh, very important aspect of what I do in particular because I'm a cartographer and most of the maps I'm involved with uh, are for the recreating public, in addition to some of those maps that support our, our work. Uh, and then I think we're probably best known in the news for firefighting, fires being more of an issue these days and uh, problems with some of our global uh, climate change. And uh, some of the other resources that we protect, of course, are some of those cultural um, resources, such as this petroglyph site located on the Coconino National Forest that I wind up with there in the end. Uh, this is a map that depicts uh, those 193 million acres that we're <coughs> responsible for taking care of for the public. Everything that's in green uh, represents national forest land and the sort of uh, uh, orangey uh, cream color, those would be the national grasslands. So that's like roughly the size of Texas, I believe. Uh, now let's transition to the talk about geographic names. Um, I guess as we make that transition, I should uh, follow up by saying um, U.S. Department of Agriculture, uh, the Forest Service, is the primary mapping agency within Department of Agriculture, and of course geographic names are picked up as part of the mapping process. Uh, that's how, that's the connection I wanted to make about um, my serving on the United States Board of Geographic Names and representing Department of Agriculture. Uh, but to speak specifically to geographic names, um, they are an intangible cultural resource that's all around us. I'm a geographer by training, and I really delight in studying um, the relationship between people and the land, and nothing tells you more about a place than a geographic name. Um, the other point I wanted to make is that with the geographic names, they belong to all of us. Um, unlike, you know, it's, it, some things are protected, but uh, 
you might own a plot of land where a particular feature belongs, but that doesn't give you the exclusive rights to name that feature whatever you want to name it. Um, that's something for all of us to decide because we're all going to see it. Now, I don't know if this figure is entirely accurate, but I thought it was interesting. Eight million names worldwide. I bet you there's more than that. A couple of quotes to get us into thinking about names, geographic names as a cultural resource. Place names can tell us a great deal about the physical geography, the culture, and the history of a place, and about the people connected with it. No wonder, after all, it's people who give these names. Um, just think about that in terms of indigenous uh, names and uh, European names that maybe have overridden some of those indigenous names and how that uh, sense of people might get lost if the names that you called places are, are no longer uh, viewable on a map. They're known as something else because somebody else came in and named them. This says it even better. A nation's identity is wrapped up in its place names, which mark the presence and history of a people. This is kind of an interesting map. Uh, if you Google it, you can find uh, an example of it. It's from National Geographic has done this online map of all these Native American names. Uh, Sweet ears of corn, red people, dugout canoe, shakes himself. I have no idea what some of these mean, but I thought tree eaters. <laughs> So the U.S. Board on Geographic Names is working to develop a Native American names policy that's more effective than the one that we're currently operating under, that recognizes the rights of Native Americans, that honors the Native American language and Native American place names that preceded those of Europeans that came in and settled the country. Many features in the U.S. with European names also have Native American names, as I spoke to before. Should these names be collected and preserved? I, I want to stop at this point and just uh, point out that the U.S. Board on Geographic Names is a standardization body. A few slides ahead, I'm going to talk about how that came to be. But this standardization body that's collected this resource of toponyms or geographic names, we now have found ourselves with this responsibility of preserving uh, these names as being as as having a role in cultural resource management that was never really part of our original mission, and and it conflicts a little bit with this desire to standardize. And I'll talk to more about that later. Um, the other point that I wanted to make that is probably very obvious to most people is that uh, many 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 of the U.S. place names are of Native American origin, as interpreted by the Europeans, and I think that's that's very important. Uh, one of my Canadian colleagues, Andre Lapierre from Quebec, he, they're very much more comfortable with multiple names for a feature in Canada. Um, and, uh, <laughs> but, but one of the things he pointed out to me was that uh, we use the word corrupted. We'll say, well, that's a corrupted form of the original word. And he said, well, you know, bankers may be corrupt, real estate agents may, may be corrupt, but words really aren't corrupt. <laughs> it's probably better rather than to say corruption or butchering it or something, say it's evolved. <laughs> <laughs> so Potomac is a good example if you look at some of the different spellings for Potomac, but that's the European spelling of an Algonquin name. This one, you can't see it, so I'm going to read it to you, but I think everybody has an interest in toponymy, even crooners. Um, Bing Crosby from Tacoma, Washington. Uh, he was asked to speak at, um, I guess, an unveiling of a, a building in Tacoma at the Bicentennial. And he says, I suppose the only genuine complaint I have against the citizens of the Puget Sound area is when some years ago, many years ago, they changed the name from Mount Tacoma to Mount Rainier. I could never fully understand the reason for this. I know it was named after a famous British adventurer or explorer, Captain Rainier. But really, his name didn't mean anything to the residents of the Tacoma area. And I, I don't think he ever visited Mount Rainier. And far more important to them was the Indian name Tacoma. Seems such a shame to me to abandon it and go for another name. Wouldn't it be nice if someday it could be changed? If I ever get time, I'm going to start a movement in that direction. 
which I'm sure will meet with mass, massive apathy. <laughs> but it's still worthwhile thinking about, and I still call it Tacoma. So that's Bing Crosby, I thought that was pretty cool. <laughs> um, and, and he is right. I would say every 10 years, so as far back as 1924, uh, people come forward and want to change the name of Mount Rainier back to some form of Mount Tacoma. Um, and there's one uh, that the board ha is dealing with right now, and we have to find new evidence to revisit a case. This is, we've, we've over, we've, local use is very important, and if most of the people in an area are not for the name, you know, federal government, we're not going to be the ones to say what you should do out in Washington State. So we have to find some evidence of local support. So we're going to go for it again. Uh, now back to what I was talking about with standardization. Back in the uh, late 19th century, there was a flurry of activity in the federal government. There were lots of scientific and exploration expeditions being conducted. I like this picture with the guy standing in the snow there, the surveyors. Uh, so the Forest Service, for example, wasn't, I guess it wasn't quite the Forest Service yet, but there were forest preserves and there was certainly surveying going on. NOAA, uh, National Oceanic and Admi uh, Atmospheric. Atmospheric, thank you, <laughs> Administration, uh, the Coast Survey doing lots of charting, uh, U.S. Geological Survey, of course. Um, and you know what? Nobody was collecting the same names. They were all either a little bit different or a lot different, and it was creating a lot of confusion. Uh, and of course, we didn't talk to each other <laughs> back then, just like we probably don't communicate enough now among federal agencies. We're trying to do a better job at that. Um, so the solution was to establish this interagency board on geographic names, and that's what Benjamin Harrison did, and then it was reconstituted in 1947 um, in the form it's in now with a mission, as I said before, primarily to um, develop a uniform geographic names for the federal government. So as a federal mapping agency, I'm only allowed to use the name for a place that's in the geographic names information system. Um, and then the, I'm going to focus on the domestic side of the house. There's a foreign side, too. I'm going to skip this slide. Um, I've got some brochures that I'll put out back if you want to go and look at either the foreign names database or the domestic names database and see what see if you can find your family name or something like that that's fun to do or just just take out check it out I'll leave that and these are just the various committees that deal with different kinds of names domestic names in the United States and in our insular areas the foreign names committee um, we have an advisory committee on undersea features and an advisory committee on Antarctic features and there even used to be a committee on extraterrestrial features <laughs> which it may come back again. Somebody was saying that over lunch today. That's the new frontier. Uh, and these are the various agencies that are on the Board on Geographic Names. And I would point out that the Library of Congress is very active on the board. Um, uh, Dr. John A. Bear, of the Chief of the uh, Geography and Mapping Division, is our current uh, chair of the board. And Peter Rudick, who uh, I think he is a member of the committee that's making this event happen today, he's on the committee. And Bob Hyatt, who's also from Library of Congress. Uh, there are three main policies of the board. You've got to use the Roman alphabet, <laughs> at least on the domestic name side. Local usage is a must. And univocity, one name for one feature. Um, these can kind of come into conflict with some of the uh, goals of our Native American Names uh, <coughs> Committee. And, and I want to touch briefly on derogatory t names today if I don't run out of time, because uh, a lot of the uh, concerns of our, our, our tribal partners have to do with derogatory names of concern to them. So here's a funny picture of the board way back then, a bunch of white-haired old men, right? <laughs> Guess they aren't. Only one, that's quite a beard. Um, uh, some of the thinking of the board back then is different than it is today. The board's evolved. This is a bad picture of one of our board meetings today. We work closely with state geographic names councils who meet annually. Every state has a geographic names authority. I don't know if you're aware of that or not. Uh, we work very closely with those folks, again, trying to get that local usage, awareness of local usage. Um, the board does support and promote official use of geographic names derived from Native American languages. This is where it gets tricky. Expert documentation of these names is 
really important. It's not always easy to find the resources to get that information. Uh, geographic, and this is how the policy reads. Geographic names derived from the languages of Native Americans are an important and integral part of the cultural heritage of the United States. Um, and an executive order was issued in 2000 by President Clinton that told federal agencies you will consult with Indian tribal governments on matters that are of concern to them. And um, this is an area that is of concern to uh, Indian tribal governments. They have a lot of other bigger concerns in terms of real concrete concerns about poverty and uh, resource rights and, and some crime issues and other governance issues. But this is a very important sense of identity, cultural issue that, and more and more tribes are coming to the board on geographic names and expressing an interest to name or rename features in their cultural or historical area of interest. So now we're not talking about just on their reservations, um, but their ancestral lands. And that's, that's even more important because obviously that's a much, much, much bigger area. There's a lot of overlap. Where we're running into problems is that Many Native American languages are oral, oral languages primarily. And it's only until recently that linguists have helped, university linguists have helped these tribes develop a written language. And in some cases, the orthography or the forms of these words are, are pretty challenging in terms of that local usage thing, will people accept this name and start to use it if they don't even understand what some of these writing marks mean? Um, and they do violate some of these rules that I spoke of earlier about use of the Roman alphabet. Uh, so that was why we decided last year when we were going round and round and round with some of these proposals that were coming forward in big groups from uh, the Confederated Tribes of the Salish Kootenai, uh, from the Coeur d'Alene tribes. Um, uh, there was a big Inuit village uh, in Alaska with over 250 names that were extremely unique. How do we do honor to these names while still you know, going forward with this, this uh, mission of trying to be standard and trying to um, serve the entire public? And that was right about the same time that President Obama called on agencies. November is uh, uh, Native American Awareness Month. And he made a speech and he pointed to that executive order of President Clinton's and he said, I want to see if you guys are really keeping to this or if you're just sort of giving it lip service. One of the things I had a tribal uh, representative tell me is, well, yeah, you invite me to sit down at the table and I tell you what it is we'd like and what we'd want. And then you just go ahead and do what you wanted to do anyway. <laughs> and so I don't know, you know, that's, that's good information. It's hard. It's been a challenge. It gets pretty exciting at our meetings sometimes. Um, what we've tried to do is get as many tribal liaisons from the uh, member agencies as we can to participate in this special committee, which I, foolishly or not, said I would chair. And we're trying to tie this with a, a tribal consultation activity that's going on within the <coughs> Department of Interior. The Secretary of Interior kind of has oversight to all the U.S. Board's activities, and in particular with the domestic names. Um, here are a couple examples of names that kind of do challenge the uh, Roman alphabet uh, policy that I was mentioning to you, and I, I wouldn't even begin to try to pronounce those names. Um, well, the woman who is the board, board staff person who communicates with proponents when they present a name, I, I think she said it was someone from the Nez Perce tribe who told her, well, you know, for the last several hundred years we've had to get used to your names. You know, it's time you started having to get used to ours. <laughs> so you, you, one, of the things, one of the things that's on the end of each of these, we call that a generic. So the first part of the name is, is the part that is the creative part. And then you know, you've got to tell, well, is this a river? Is this a stream? Is this a lake, a mountain? That's the generic. Um, a lot of times the generic is embedded in the native name already. Um, most tribes have been very willing to add that English generic on the end. Not all, but some. But still, some of the local acceptance things that we hear that are um, 
sometimes, you know, I think people, people reveal themselves a lot <laughs> with some of the remarks in this effort. Uh, that's too hard to pronounce, you know. So if you, if you change it to that, we're never going to use it. We're going to say, you know, it's that stream that used to be called Squaw Creek. Um, the writing marks aren't standard. My system can't handle it. And frankly, that's a real problem for the federal government. We have all kinds of firewall issues. To go out and download a font, even if it's free, uh, I'm pretty sure we wouldn't be allowed to do I'm looking at my colleague here from the Forest Service. We probably wouldn't be able to do it. Um, but another thing we hear is, there was nothing wrong with the old name. What's the matter with the old name? Uh, so. Here are some solutions that we've been looking at to try to get around some of these problems. Uh, my colleague in Canada there in Quebec, one of the things they tried in one of their provinces in one small area was to do this thing called a dual name. I think you'll see this in a lot of the signage out west. I think on the Flathead Reservation, you're going to see both the native name and the English name. And unless you're an expert in that language, you're not going to be sure if that English name is a direct translation or if that is something else, but I guess we'll figure out how that goes. Another, um, another thing that we're looking at is, uh, and this challenges our concept of one name or one feature, and that is to consider alternate names. With a, they're equivalent, but you use them in the right context. Um, if you don't have the capacity to handle in Flamcle Lake, you can go with Black Bear Lake. Or if you want to use the uh, native form, you can. In this case, with Inflamka, the uh, Salish Kootenai worked with us on that. The first name, they, that's been phoneticized for us to help ease pronunciation. But I think people still look at those hyphens and the, that's the other thing, lack of vowels really trips us up. <laughs> um, I want to talk for a minute about derogatory names because a lot of the tribes, as they're coming forward to us, it's because the states where they have ancestral interests have passed legislation to remove the word squaw from the features because many tribal folks find that word to be offensive. Not all, but many I've found in especially out west. It's an Algonquian word um, and it means Indian woman. but. Like other words that you can think of, it's how the word is used that makes it offensive. Um, there was a program on the Oprah Winfrey show a few years back where I think there was some Native American women talking with Oprah. And they made it pretty clear that when um, somebody called them squaw, it was being done in a very derisive manner. It doesn't necessarily mean women's genitalia, which some people will tell you but it is a slam. Um, so in Montana, in Minnesota, in Oregon, in South Dakota, we're working to eliminate that name from the landscape. Wasn't sure how many people were aware of that. Because as I said, many don't find this to be offensive. Uh, one of the women that's helping us out with a special committee is Abenaki. And that's Algonquin, and uh, she has no problem with that word. It means Indian woman. Uh, just for your information, the board has identified two words to be universally derogatory. Um, I'm sure you can imagine when those early days when we were going through maps and collecting names and putting them into our uh, databases, we were probably, we were finding lots and lots and lots of names that I would cringe to say here. Um, and a decision was made that those needed to be changed. Now, the variant name is still there, but the pejorative form of the word Negro and the pejorative form of the word Japanese are not allowed. Uh, some people even feel that Negro needs to be changed to something else, but it seems to me that, that we aren't there yet. There's a pretty good split in opinion about that one. Because not all tribes find squaw to be offensive, it really can't be universally declared. The other problem is there isn't one universal name that every <coughs> tribe would agree to to replace that word squaw with. So they are handled on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, I want to tell a couple of interesting stories. Have any of you heard of Paestua Peak in Arizona? Squaw Peak in Arizona um, was renamed back uh, 
2003, Janet Napolitano, she's currently now our head of uh, Department of Homeland Security. She was the governor of Arizona. And at that time, uh, Lori Paestua, who is a Hopi Indian, was killed in Iraq. And she was the first service woman to die in Iraq. And she was the first Native American woman to die in service of her country. And it, it meant a great deal to the people in Arizona and to the Hopi Indians in particular. So Janet Napolitano said, I really hate having to look out there at Squaw Peak anyway. So let's change it to Paestua Peak. The Board on Geographic Names, we have a five-year waiting period after someone dies before we commemorate them with a, a feature name. So they were willing to wait for the five years, but I guess during those five years, Arizona already considered it Paestua Peak. So it was one of those things where we had two names for one feature. <laughs> um, but it was a, there was a really wonderful ceremony when the board um, officially adopted that name. And I believe the Hopi and the Navajo, do, who don't necessarily get along so well, actually got together to celebrate this woman. And uh, you know, she's been honored. And a name that's offensive was eliminated. Uh, this is just another one of those very interesting names the board did approve, Esculpte Creek, uh, formerly Squaw Creek. There are a lot of Squaw Creeks. A lot. I went into the database to look and see how many there were. I mean, talk about duplicate names. Um, and a historian said, well, you know, a lot of times uh, uh, prospectors or whatever would, you know, come to this area. There would be all these women, you know, doing washing whatever by the creek. And so every other creek was Squaw Creek. Anyway, there's this, the, the Umatilla came forward with this name that they wanted to change. Um, from Squaw Creek to Esculpte, which means the throat slitting place. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a really good story because as the story goes, these women were working by the creek and they were uh, attacked by an, another tribe. Of, and they were men and they were marauding and they were probably up to you know all kinds of mischief and these women beat them back and actually cut their throats. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So anyway, we now have instead of Squaw Creek, the Throat Slitting Place Creek. So and that's the other thing that's really interesting with these names. They, they often describe things that went on there, whereas I think our culture, it's more to name it after somebody or have some kind of a descriptive name like Twinkle Lake or something. <laughs> um, to, <laughs> to wrap up, um, I'm going to be working on this process for a long time. I, can, I, I think that that's a good thing, though. If we want these names to endure, it's worth taking the time to make sure we do this right. Um, but the process can really be frustrating for people that want their name right now. Um, but it's worth taking the time so that we can make the best decisions that we can. And so I think that's all I have. So thank you. <laughs> This has been just fabulous. I can't remember the last time I learned so much from such different sources in such a short period of time. And so uh, I thank you all for making this day so, so wonderful, so rich, and such a learning experience that we can bring to the whole issue of, of human rights. So it's been terrific. And I want to give our audience the opportunity to ask any questions that they might have of our panelists. Are there any questions? Yes. Could you rise? I'll try to repeat the question if, if you don't have a, a strong voice yet. <laughs> oh, we have a micro. Oh, oh Wes, great. Yeah, with it. <laughs> a traveling mic. Great. I have a, a friend who lives on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in um, South Dakota. In fact, he's the person who told me about the event. Um, I offered to ask a question. Since he was not able to be here, um, consequently, he and some of the elders wrote a statement. In short, it is a statement from a people my husband and I have come to know who are living with the consequences of 500 years of calculated discrimination, brutality, and or indifference for whom attaining a poverty level of income would be a step up. They live in third world conditions with diabetes, alcoholism, and suicide rates, and very little economic infrastructure. Would 
the Indigenous, Indigenous Peoples' Rights Act, if signed on to by the United States, provide a better legal framework to enforce treaty obligations, protect tribal lands and customs from tradition, and build a brighter future? And what advice would you give to my friends? Kelly, I think you might know a little bit about that. Are you, are you referring to the, the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples? Um, I understand that, that um, I, I can't, obviously I can't answer your, your question, um, but I do understand um, what to clarify that um, the United States, uh, I believe uh, Australia, Canada, are possibly the remaining countries that haven't signed on to the Universal, uh, the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Um, New Zealand only just did this year. Um, and it relates to um, uh, it, a lot of, with, as I know from New Zealand, a lot of it relates to um, what it means in terms uh, in terms of any compensation and and um, legal the legal rights and things like that, and it, it does and it creates issues. Um, so that it, I see it remains an issue here here in the states as well, and it's it's being dealt with in other countries too. But um, I obviously can't. Does anyone in the audience know how that would specifically affect economic rights? I'm sorry to say I do not. Or a panelist? Yes, I'm sorry. Hi, I'm, I'm, my name is Philomena Quebec, and I work for the Indian Law Resource Center. And we're, we're very hopeful that the United States will adopt the declaration very soon. Um, they, there's no official position yet, but we're, we're still pushing it and working for it. Um, while the declaration is not a legally binding document, it does it does provide um, there there's lots of customary international law that that um, you know that there are collective rights of indigenous people that need to be recognized by states and need to be um, you, you know need to be enforced within the countries. Um, you know, one of the things that you're talking about as far as tribal consultations is is something that's in the UN Declaration. There's, an, there's something called free prior and informed consent. And um, there's recognition of land rights and all, all kinds of human rights for um, Native American people and indigenous people in the world. So if, if you want more, we can, we can talk more about it later. Is anyone else interested in commenting on that? Anne, do you have something? Oh, a question? OK. Question over here, Wes? <laughs> well, this way we'd be sure everyone, and it's caught by the, the tape. Um, after having traveled quite a bit, I guess my, my question to the panel is, um, I was recently in Southeast Asia and was a bit appalled at what I call the um, tourism colonization of various tribes in the northern regions. Um, and had a lot of discussions with various people that I met through HUD and, and different groups. And, and my question is with <coughs> indigenous populations, it seems that is if they get a step forward, some new type of colonization comes in. So for example, now there's the tourism colonization where they're, they're bound by the money that the tourists bring in to continue a certain lifestyle. And what was appalling to me is the, the tourists viewing these villages are not aware that these people are not only just poor, but they're impoverished. Um, so as we went through discussions, my question for you is we uh, kind of came to a conclusion that healthcare, clean water, and education are key compo components of any indigenous population to help them move forward um, in a progressively changing society. Um, and my question is, do you agree with that? Do you? What is your view on education and what type of education? Should they have optional, you get the, the tribal education, but you also get the European Western education? What are your thoughts on that and the role of education to keep the indigenous populations moving progressively forward? I'll have a first swipe at that. Uh, I, there's a phenomenon that's even worse than the sort of tourism that you mention, and it's called human rights tourism. I don't know if any of you have come across this, uh, which is even more crass. It involves usually rich, often Americans, being taken to places like Rwanda, where they have the opportunity of touching the stump of, a, uh, of someone who's lost their limb in the Rwandan 
the genocide. Now the idea behind this is that it gives people who would otherwise not be confronted with atrocity an opportunity to to jump into a set of emotions that may then trigger uh, that person, that individual, to take political action on behalf of those who cannot take political action for themselves. And I think it's part of a spectrum uh, where those who have little are, uh, are made into a spectacle and we that look at those who have little have to be very cautious that we don't become voyeurs and that the process doesn't become purient. Uh, so your question about education, I think, raises a profoundly troubling moral problem. It's not just a problem of distribution of resources, but it's a deeply moral issue. For centuries, maybe back to the Silk Road, those who have power and military and economic resources have been able to colonize those who don't and uh, that that process continues today in a form of economic uh, appropriation uh, it, all you need to do is to go into places like afghanistan or um, mongolia and see mtv to realize that cultural appropriation is sometimes the, the most pernicious deepest form of, of colonization Education is really tricky because on the one hand, in today's global world, if a community doesn't speak the lingua franca of economic transactions, then it will wither and die on the vine. And yet we all know that uh, through a process of loans through the World Bank and the IMF, that there's been a form of structural adjustment that has been assumed as the norm around the world and upon which funding has been conditioned. There's been good results, there's been mediocre results, and there's been bad results. So education is a double-edged sword. Uh, sh should the education seek to displace what is already in place? Uh, I think the answer to that's pretty easy. The answer to that's no. But that's too easy an answer in a world of scarce resources what little there is has to be distributed. And most communities will opt for a distribution that will allow for an increase in social goods and allow for an increase in economic transactions. Alas, often the downside of an increase in economic transactions is a decrease in ways of the past, past because the ways of the past were based in economic isolation. And today's world is based very much on there being no borders and there being masses of transactions across the old borders of nation states, across the old borders of community groups, across the old borders of, of one linguistic group to another. So as, as always, there's only one right way of proceeding and that's with great caution and with great sensitivity and I would say always again to ask that those who are inside the community, the stakeholders in the community, to have the dominant voice at the table. It's not a guarantee and it's not a guarantee that the next generation won't turn back to the current generation and say, you, you, you really made the wrong decision on our behalf and, and, it ha and it has ripple effects which are hurting us now. So there's no guarantees and there's no template and there's no one size fit all, fits all, uh, and it, which is a discomforting answer, I understand. <laughs> say in terms of New Zealand um, there and, and commenting on the um, the ownership I guess of, of the the culture and um, being at the table and, and being involved in decision making um, the in terms of education a very the very strong movement um, that started in the early 80s um, uh, was the Kohanga Reo mo movement which is the language nest movement um, and and today it was it was controversial it was um, um, non-Māori New Zealanders um, push back on it in terms of 
we shouldn't have separate education, we're one people, this sort of, these sort of notions, um, or you know, you won't have a, um, our system's better and that sort of thing, but um, it, it was pushed for and, um, and Māori now have um, kohanga reo language nest preschool education um, in Māori language um, and that, that's controlled by um, tr their own trusts and, and things like that and, and regulated. Um, and, it's, and it's open to Māori and non-Māori and things like that. And so that it, it's one area where um, self-regulation and, and self-control of, um, of a system um, has been a great success. Steve, do you have any comment about Canada? Does anyone in the audience want to comment about experience that they have? I know many uh, people in the audience have uh, a lot of uh, jurisdictional expertise. Yolanda? Wes, do you have the mic? <laughs> I wanted to come back uh, to the term colonialism and modern colonialism. In my current studies, I have run across biocolonialism. What is meant by that is that particularly in the US and in Hawaii, uh, the indigenous have to prove by DNA tests now, that they belong to a particular tribe or can become a member of the tribe, a citizen of the tribe. As you are aware, probably we have dual citizenship here in the US for our tribes. They are tri uh, citizens of the tribe and citizens of the United States. But first to become a member of the tribe, they have to go through this cruel uh, experience of years often uh, to get recognized by the Bureau of Indian Affairs as a member of the tribe. Is there any uh, comment on that? Well, I think well, in particular, what struck me as you spoke is that I know um, in, in the work that I'm doing in particular, we're only allowed to uh, inquire towards federally recognized tribes and that's another huge hurdle that tribal entities deal with and that is trying to gain this federal recognition and I, I you know it, it to me that that's burden enough but to, to just have to prove you are who you are, say you are through a DNA test is crushing um, and and so when I hear all the very serious things that you've all just raised, you know, to me, what I'm doing, it just seems like s such a, a no-brainer to, to, the least we can do is recognize these cultural uh, rights of, of geographic names, and I, I'm just really, it's, it's hard, and there, I, there, are, there are no magic answers. I think we just have to keep trying to do the best we can to uh, change our, to help people change their thinking. <laughs> well, Yolanda, I, I'm not 100% sure I understand the question. Um, there are a couple problems. Um, there's one problem that for certain purposes, individuals would like to be recognized as Aboriginal for potential benefits that they might receive from the national government we're talking about, or a state government. There's also, there are also individuals who would like to be recognized by individual tribes or bands for membership in those tribes or bands. Uh, I think all um, Aboriginal groups have some problems with people who would like to hold themselves out as being legitimate members of those groups, but which the, I don't know what core membership, um, does, they do, they're simply not recognized by that group. Um, so I, I'm not aware of governments requiring DNA tests. Um, it, it may be though that certain Indian tribes may use that as a, um, as a means of excluding membership, uh, excluding those who uh, uh, would uh, hold themselves out as members or, eligible, or being eligible for membership. 
um, then the shoe is really on the other foot, isn't it? Um, and um, is this is that as objectionable to you as uh, it is if the government requires uh, um, some sort of proof of uh, um, bl blood lineage and uh, eligibility? Related that you can prove that you have a relationship with uh, families in a particular tribe. You don't go through this blood quantum thing. What our Indians have to do and what the Hawaiians have to do. The one sixteenth in the United States uh, eligibility factor, whereas in Canada, it's usually um, through you're considered a status or a registered Indian by membership and a acceptance of membership in a group. But you know, here in the United States we uh, and, and in Canada, we have had problems with individuals who have held themselves out as being members of individual groups uh, and, individ and those groups not being particularly happy about that. Um, so right. it, it's, a, it's a complicated issue. Um, it, it's not simply, I don't think it's simply a, um, uh, government versus uh, um, people issue. It's also um, a, um, in many cases, it's also a tribal issue. In particular, an intertribal issue rather, or tribal government issue rather than federal government issue. Well, the whole question of you know who, who is a, who is an Aboriginal is a difficult one. It's one of the reasons why the Canadians have have stayed away a little bit from the uh, Indian uh, uh, Arts and uh, Crafts Act approach uh, because uh, identifying who is an Indian. Um, the problem is, is across the board. I mean, I'm sure there are problems in government, but there are also problems with. We've read of individuals who have been given sort of honorary membership in, uh, in, in various uh, Indian groups and then have uh, uh, used that to assert that they are members of that group. That, that can also be a problem. So um, yes, determining who, is an, uh, who qualifies as an Aboriginal for various purposes is difficult across the board, and uh, I think all governments and tribes are struggling with that issue. Well, we can tell but, that it, oh. but this has become a tremendous civil rights issue because of the number of ex-slaves who banded together with a variety of tribes. This was especially true in my state with, for example, the Seminoles. And for some of the Western states, uh, which, uh, were uh, settled as the basis of the trial of tears, uh, who are now trying to disenfranchise the black segment of their particular uh, tribes. And it also you know, has an impact on who, ha who can be uh, a, a federally recognized tribe. The Lumbees, for example, in North Carolina have always had uh, a very large commingling with ex-slaves, and it's been difficult for them to prove that they are true Aborigines. And, and it's further complicated by the fact that in the United States, there's so much intermarriage among tribes that people can't get their 1 16th in any <laughs> individual tribe. Right. And so that all really has to be figured out as part of it. So well, thank you for agreeing with me, Kathy. That's a complicated <laughs> issue. <laughs> yes, and because it's a complicated issue, perhaps it's best discussed over food and drink. So before I invite you to our reception, please join me in thanking a number of groups who've made this really wonderful discussion hap uh, possible today. And they would include um, the Law Library's Human Rights Day Committee, and their names are listed in the brochure as well as our terrifically supportive Friends of the Law Library who exist as a separate organization but who provide a number of ways for the Law Library to put on programs, provide services, and undertake projects. And to them we are constantly in debt because they really assist us. 
the entire staff of the Law Library who, whether they wanted to or not, were uh, enlisted to assist in making this program possible today. The Library of Congress's Information Technology Services, our special events group, and always behind the camera, but phenomenally helpful at all kinds of events, the incomparable Abby Brock, who makes every one of us look good. <laughs> uh, good. We thank all of you. We ask you, on your way out to the foyer of this room, please stop and look at the display table. There are a number of things there that we hope you will find of interest, both related to this program, an intellectual product from the Law Library of Congress relating to human rights, as well as opportunities for you to become a friend or to tweet with us, to know about our Facebook page, and any number of ways that if you found this program of interest, you can continue to be connected to us because while this program was fabulous, I am happy to say it is not unique to the portfolio of the Law Library of Congress. Thank you again and let's all talk outside. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.